Meat production worldwide is set to almost double by 2050 as nations become wealthier and demand more animal protein. To maintain our present level of consumption at this present time, beyond 2050, we would need an additional half a planet. Selon l'Organisation des Nations Unies pour l'alimentation et l'agriculture, le secteur de l'élevage contribue pour 14,5% aux émissions de gaz à effet de serre dues à l'activité humaine. As I become a father for the first time, there are more and more revelations about the way we are raising the animals that feed us. study from the World Health Organization has revealed that eating processed meat can cause cancer. Meat consumption isn't just the source of health problems. It could also lead to widespread species extinction, according to a recently published study. Feeding my son his first mouthfuls and seeing the animals around him through his eyes has led me to look at this information in a new way. It has caused me to consider the choices that we make to feed ourselves more closely, as if suddenly, for him, I could no longer remain indifferent and had to find out more. What's happened is we've rationalized and made efficient uh, the production of meat and we've industrialized it as we've industrialized almost every other form of production on earth and uh, the efficiency uh, allows us to produce more meat than ever before by far before world war ii let's say there was none of what we're talking about many people raising two pigs six pigs ten pigs 20 pigs 200 pigs. No one was raising 10,000 pigs. All pigs were pastured pigs. Chicken, same kinds of thing. They may have been raised by the hundreds. Now they're raised by the hundreds of thousands. So the scale has gone from a human scale that's comprehensible to a scale that's really incomprehensible. The problem is that the system has an expiration date. Is it still possible to feed animals to our children while respecting the planet, the animals' welfare, and our health? I'm not an animal rights activist. I'm a journalist. The best way to answer this question is to go out into the field. Traveling all over the world, I'm going to meet with men and women who are inventing innovative ways of raising animals that respect man, nature, and animals. I want to put these initiatives together to find out if another way of consumption is possible and viable, and if there is still time left to do things differently. We created, we created industrial agriculture. It was intentional. There was a decision made to say, how can we produce the most grain possible? How can we produce the most animals possible? There were other directions we could have gone in. We could have said, how can we make the healthiest diet for our people possible? How can we make sure that our land is poisoned as little as possible? How can we exhibit humaneness towards animals as much as possible? We chose to ignore those issues in favor of yield. Now it's time to move in a different direction. I heard about a man in the plains of the American Midwest who decided to challenge the dominant industrial model. He has developed a new method of livestock farming that is closer to nature to prove that doing things differently is still possible. I'm Jude Becker and my farm 
has been operated by me since I returned from university in 1999. And the farm is certified organic. I began this system with only six sows, and today we have 150. And we are producing more than 2,000 pigs per year. My farm could be considered uh, the opposite system from uh, the industrial philosophy. Our philosophy is based on allowing the pigs to express their natural instincts because this promotes animal welfare and I think it promotes health of the animals. If we are very quiet, I will show you a litter of piglets which was born during the night. See, there are about 12 pigs. Well, this, this house is insulated, and there is around uh, 10 centimeters of insulation. So the, the wall is quite thick, and it's made of steel, so it's very strong. And in winter, it keeps the sow quite warm, and also it keeps the heat out in summer because we open the back window and keep keep uh, ventilation it's a more natural system the pig can grow in its natural way by living outside and experiencing the earth because a pig is has this special nose to dig in the earth and if it cannot have this what then it's not complete it's not completely a pig something is missing This kind of farming resembles the images that we see in adverts. However, over 80% of pig meat doesn't come from farms like Jude Becker's, but from industrial farms like this one. Here, everything happens inside the buildings. Donc là, on va arriver dans, dans une salle de maternité, une salle de, de, de Miss Bas. Donc euh, voilà, vous allez pouvoir euh, voir les petits porcelets. Elles sont inséminées le, le même jour, presque toutes. Enfin, forcément qu'elles mettent bas euh, le même jour aussi. Quoi. Donc, on appelle ça une, une case de miche bas. Le truie est rentré euh, une semaine avant de mettre bas pour qu'elle s'accoutume à la salle et qu'elle prenne ses. qu'elle ne soit pas stressée le, 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 le jour de la miche bas. Elle reste dans cette. Casa avec ses petits pendant trois semaines. Et pourquoi vous avez besoin de ça euh, En fait, on, elles, sont, elles sont bloquées parce que une truie, euh, ça n'a pas forcément l'instinct très maternel. Ça aurait tendance à, à, à écraser ses, ses porcelets. Une truie, euh, 80% de son temps, ça s'est allongé. Hein. Donc, euh, en fait, euh, qu'elle ait de la place. Euh... Et là, elles peuvent se retourner Non. Non, non. Les systèmes industriels de production animale, ils visent à produire de la matière animale. Quand vous êtes dans, euh, dans un système porcin, le but, ce n'est pas d'élever des cochons, c'est de produire du porc. Pas des porcs, pas des cochons, du porc, de la matière animale porcine. Une porcherie, déjà, c'est un lieu fermé, une zone fermée, dans laquelle il y a des bâtiments fermés, dans lequel il y a des boxes fermées, donc c'est un emboîtement de lieux fermés dans lesquels, in fine, se trouvent des truies, des cochons. Il n'y a pas de la nature là-dedans. Le but, c'est que les animaux produisent le plus possible, le plus vite possible. Ils sont sur leur case en béton, là, ou sur les petits, ils ne bougent pas. Ils n'ont rien à faire, ils mangent. Ils mangent, ils mangent, ils mangent, ils grossissent, ils grossissent. Et en cinq mois et demi, ils passent d'un kilo à plus de 100 kg. On imagine toujours des cochons en train de gambader à l'extérieur. Là, c'est quand même assez restreint, quoi. Oui, c'est sûr, oui. Mais euh, aujourd'hui, beaucoup de la production est faite comme ça. Et les animaux sont quand même euh, relativement en forme. Là, on voit qu'ils ils euh, viennent vers nous, il y a qui courent, qui s'amusent. Qui... Enfin, si dehors, ils seraient forcément beaucoup plus heureux. Le système industriel, ce qu'il a de particulier, 
est lié au système économique, c'est qu'il n'y a qu'une seule rationalité, qui est la rationalité économique. Le but du travail avec les animaux, c'est le profit. Il n'y a pas d'autre but. Ce n'est pas la relation aux animaux, ce n'est pas la relation à la nature, ce n'est pas de produire des aliments qui soient bons et sains. C'est juste que les animaux ils servent à générer de l'argent. So here you don't use gestation uh, no, cages? No, we don't need any kind of a crate or cage. It's not necessary in this system. In the outdoor system, we are relying on the instincts, the motherly instincts of the sow to raise her piglets. And so we don't spend too many, too many hours here every day. For me, this kind of work is very interesting to be in charge of a natural system and be responsible for the care of these creatures. It produces a kind of joy just to walk amongst the pigs in the field. It's a kind of therapy to simply watch them run and play. And as a farmer, that's very fulfilling. They're not just a, a kind of product to maximize the efficiency for, a, uh, like a factory. They are, they are living, sentient creatures. Farming that takes into account the animals' well-being and frees them from their cages is indeed possible. But is it economically viable on a larger scale? Industrial production has radically reduced food prices. In the 1950s, European households spent an average of 45% of their budget on food. Today, it is just around 15%. The pursuit of economic efficiency at any cost, which has benefited us all, has been pushed to its limits by one type of farming in particular. By any industrial standard of productivity, the chicken industry is a model of how to do things efficiently, cheaply. There is nearly complete genetic uniformity. These animals have been bred to grow fatten very quickly, and so they are kept in complete confinement. Chicken production today is that these birds have been bred to mature five to six weeks. It's, it's, it's remarkable how short their lifespan is. What is the normal life expectancy for a chicken? If you took a wild jungle fowl and looked at its normal life expectancy, which is where these chickens ultimately come from, 20 years. Today, chickens are bred twice as fast as they were 40 years ago, but they are twice as big. Industrial chicken farms no longer allow cameras in, so the only way to film them is at night, covertly. I go along with Christian Adam and two of his friends, German activists who are against industrial farming. The farm is about, no, about 200 meters away in front of us. It's a chicken farm for about Uh, at all, 120,000 chickens. So there are three holes of 40,000 chickens. Oh, it's, it's huge now. It's not really. Actually, it's a normal farm. Yeah. Uh, so the, the, the chickens are always hungry because of the breeding uh, in a way that they, they are always hungry, that they eat and eat and eat so they can grow very, very fast. And that means lots of problems for the animals. And this is something that happens in every farm. And now you can smell it. Yeah. Exactly when we go in, just very, 
You move, move very slowly. These chickens were born only 20 days ago, but they only have 10 days left before they are killed and arrive on our plates. The smell of bird droppings is hard to bear. It is humid and hot. This is what the industry never wants to talk about. From this point, I already see 10 dead animals that are laying, lying about the, the, the living ones. And actually, that is pretty much. Um, but if you think about normally in a farm like this, you have a mortality rate of about 8%. And that means that in a farm like this, over the time they are raised, 4,000 animals die. Not in the slaughterhouse, but because of the conditions here. When you look at the ground, that, that's all old shit from the animals. Some are thirsty, they can't get, even get to the, to, the, to the water. So when they can't stand up, they will die of, of thirst. These are the chickens we eat in every normal store in the gastronomy. Um, this is how about, I think, 95%. I think at least 95% uh, of chicken in Germany is raised, and these are the chickens we eat. We're here at, at midnight, around midnight, and the, 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 whole, the whole hall is full of light. It's, um, that the animals c do eat all the time, because everything is here to, to, to make them grow as fast as they can. And uh, this is one part of it. They, they should not sleep because they should eat. And that's why the, the halls are lit up all the night long. for economic efficiency has also been particularly damaging for the well-being of animals in the egg production industry. The majority of the eggs we eat come from battery farms like this one. These animals will never see daylight until they leave for the abattoir. There are 13 chickens per square meter. Everything is done to minimize the cost of production. Worldwide, 60% of egg-laying hens live in cages. It's 68% in France. Seeing this with my own eyes, I realize that it really is time to consume differently and avoid eating products from industrial farming as much as possible. But are the alternative methods realistic? Can animal welfare be respected without causing an excessive increase in production costs? In the United States, there is an innovative method for farming egg-laying hens on a large scale while respecting their well-being. I have a meeting with the Brunquells. They have created Egg Innovation, one of the biggest initiatives for free-range hens in the world. Every day, one million eggs are packaged in their factory, 3,000 per second. They have a turnover of more than 50 million euros per year. I grew up on a caged farm. Then probably 20 years ago, I stepped into my first cage-free barn. And it kind of you know, destroyed some of my stereotypes. 
And then we took that a step further every couple of years uh, and, you know, said, OK, let's let the doors open. When we saw the improvement of the birds' health, their, their, their welfare, uh, it, was, it was just hard to say that this was incorrect. There's nothing in a cage that is going to lean into the birds' natural behaviors of perching, foraging, dust bathing, socialization. Cages simply aren't going to provide that. And they, it's impossible. It's impossible for them to provide that. John Brunquell freed the hens from their cages and gave them access to the open air. But he hasn't given up mass production. He owns 1,300,000 hens spread over 65 buildings like this one throughout the country. You said that inside, John? There was like 20,000 chicken. Yes. And is it a normal size for you? Yes. So our bar, this barn is 24,000 square feet. Everything is measured. So there's 1.2 square feet per bird inside. There's 22 square feet of pasture. There's six inches of perch space. Can they be really happy? Because they are so much in the same place. So, so a really good indication of happiness is if, if you walked into a cage barn, you would see a lot of anxiety. Even in a cage-free barn, they would typically run away. The fact that I can walk up to the birds and they stay and they're curious, and, and the fact that I can do that, that is a sign of happiness. That tells you how calm they are. They're not afraid of people because they've been allowed to engage in natural behavior. So they have the room to move around. This is a choice they're making. If they want to, they can go outside. Nothing's stopping them. OK, she's not running away. Hey, you. Birds don't like to be petted. They like to be stroked underneath their chin. What we found is every time we improved welfare, I found my production went up, my mortality went down, good things happened with the birds. And, and we did it initially because it was a belief, but the belief was proven to be accurate by the productivity of the animal. So we can blend scale and size with animal welfare. John Brunquell has succeeded in improving the well-being of his chickens while providing eggs for the breakfasts of 5,000 Americans every day. But he has two problems left to resolve. The end of his hens' lives, who after a year and a half, when they no longer lay enough eggs, will be slaughtered and go into the food chain. And the beginning of their lives. Where do they come from, the chicks? We will buy day-old chicks from the hatchery, and then that's when we will start taking over and managing the bird. And this is actually a kind of link in the supply chain that is rarely talked about. Hatcheries, of course, you don't know whether you're getting a male or a female uh, upon hatching. And they employ uh, very highly skilled individuals called chicken sexers. It's very hard to tell. It's very hard to pick up a chick and tell if it's a male or a female. And what these chicken sexers do, of course, if it's a hen, they will put it in the keep, you know, box. And if it's a male, they will, um, usually these males are thrown into a grinder or into a bag where they suffocate, or in some cases they will just gas a bunch of the, the male chickens. Um, hatchery, might produce in a, in a day 50,000 chickens, half of them. So yeah, 10, 20,000 a day being killed.
They may not be perfect yet, but whether it's on a small or a large scale, methods that respect animals already exist. But respecting animals is not the only thing we should take into account when feeding our children. We should also ask, what kind of planet do we want to leave them? With seven and a half billion people on Earth, meat and fish consumption is excessive and has become a serious problem. To produce the animals that we eat today, we are damaging the world they will grow up in tomorrow. I mean, the numbers are pretty clear if you want to just begin with greenhouse gas emissions. Industrial agriculture, industrial animal agriculture is responsible for at least 18% of all greenhouse gas emissions. And that's a kind of remarkable chunk of responsibility for just one industry in the global economy. Actually more um, productive of greenhouse gases overall than the entire global transportation industry, just to kind of put that in perspective. To face the rising consumption of meat, we have chosen to produce more animals more intensively. Alors ça, je savais même pas que ça existait. C'est impressionnant. C'est des centaines, des milliers de petites niches dans lesquelles il y a des veaux. Ils sont attachés à une chaîne. Ils sont là en plein cagnard. To fatten up the billions of animals as quickly as possible and to increase their yield, we grow more and more genetically modified grain. To plant them, we destroy forests, which increases global warming and destroys biodiversity. The quantity of water required for these crops, like corn or soy, exhausts the groundwater. And the huge quantities of pesticides and chemical fertilizers that we apply destroy the soil and endangers our health. Are you okay with the smell? Well, when you are here after two, three days... You get used to it. Yeah. <laughs> Do you eat this meat? No, 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 like it. You don't like it? Mm-mm. Why? No. I don't like it. See how we feed the cows. I you don't? Have chemicals to feed. Oh, too much chemicals. Every day, they die about 10 heads every day. Really? Yeah, sometimes more. There is another consequence of this massive industrialization. To distribute the grain all around the world, they are loaded onto huge petrol-guzzling ships that cross the oceans, further impacting global warming. It is safe to say that industrial animal agriculture represents perhaps the worst misallocation of natural resources in human history. If we feed the world the way we're feeding the world now, we're going to run out of resources. And it's going to lead to political instability. It's going to lead to a situation where the world's poorest suffer the consequences the most. It's going to lead to perhaps wars over land and access to land and access to water. I mean, things could become very severe. So we need to start thinking about using our land in ways that produce the most calories with the least environmental impact and the least amount of resources. generation of farmers 
have decided not to follow this dominant system and try to reinvent farming methods to feed the world differently. In the United States, Portugal, France, they are concerned with respecting animals but also preserving the environment and our health. Mon métier, c'est surtout un métier de passionné, passion de la terre. Après, bien évidemment, de l'élevage, mais de la terre en général, de, du respect, du respect de cette planète et de la capacité qu'on a de pouvoir vivre avec cette terre. The animals are not here to feed us. The animals and the other beings are here because the planet needs their functions. And that's the big change. Using their energy, it's also a function of each being. They are here to be part of this wonderful, very intelligent system where we also belong. What I like about it is it's kind of bringing back the, the initial way that things were done, you know, hundreds of years ago is what we've moved away from and realized that probably wasn't the right system. So now we're coming back to what worked for generations long before us. So what these cattle are eating, there's different, several different varieties out here. You've got some cabbages, kales, there's millets, and there's vetch, which would be a very high protein. You also have clovers, which would be another very high protein crop. So this is a very high energy uh, crop that they're grazing. So these cattle are gaining, uh, could be two pounds a day just on this. There's nothing brought to them. In the very conservative American Midwest, John Wood and his son Johnny are pioneers of a new method which emerged some years ago. To feed their cows, they decided to turn their back on intensive farming and completely avoid grain. Their cattle only eat the grass that's in the field. When the cattle are moved daily, they can eat. It's their choice. Uh, the feed is, they come to the feed, the feed's not brought to them, um, which would be different than the conventional model. They're eating what they're designed to eat so that the consumer can eat what they're designed to eat. This whole system is with the future in mind. It's good for the animals, it's good for the planet, it's good for the people. I mean, it's a, it's a holistic system. Everything ties in to one, and it's all based off of what we're standing in right here. With this system, the woods must wait an extra six to seven months before their cows go to the slaughterhouse because it takes longer for them to fatten up. Therefore, in the end, the meat is a bit more expensive, but it's completely grain-free. It reaches consumers all over the U.S. who want to support more environmentally friendly farms. We're seeing more and more farms succeeding economically when opting for alternative methods of production. Je suis Jacques Abatouch, je suis éleveur de, 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 de vaches, d'élevage bovin, je suis producteur de veau. Ce type d'élevage est respectueux de l'environnement parce qu'on nourrit les vaches en autonomie complète. C'est-à-dire qu'aujourd'hui, on n'achète rien à l'extérieur. Tout est produit sur la ferme. Donc on est en circuit fermé complètement. Et effectivement, c'est quand même quelque chose de... Euh, de ce qui paraît être le, le bon sens paysan. C'est vraiment euh, la base, normalement, de l'élevage. C'est-à-dire qu'on produit en fonction de ce qu'on est capable de produire. C'est-à-dire qu'on produit les bêtes qu'on est capable de, de nourrir. Hein. Aujourd'hui, c'est quand même une fierté, une sécurité aussi. Je ne suis pas dépendant de l'extérieur. Ou s'il y a une crise, quelle qu'elle soit, de, de production, de, de tourteaux de soja OGM d'Amérique du Sud, de, de, mais ça ne sera pas un problème pour nous. He grows the grass himself, next to the pastures. And to supplement the food for his calves, he grows his own grain. A few hectares of barley a year suffice. This system is very far from intensive agriculture, but he is not concerned with the profit margin, just with satisfying the demand. His meat is a bit more expensive, but his farming method makes it a product that is very desirable for restaurant owners. Uh, 
Voilà. On n'utilise pas de pesticides, on n'utilise pas de désherbants, on n'utilise pas de traitement d'engrais de, de, chimiques. Déjà, on n'impacte pas l'environnement par rapport à ça. La seule chose que j'importe, c'est des déchets d'autres. Je, je gère leurs déchets qui seraient polluants autrement. C'est-à-dire que du fumier cheval, de la fiente de poule, si c'est pas bien géré, c'est polluant. Là, au contraire, sur la surface qu'on a, on en fait, mais on est loin d'avoir des doses, mais, mais c'est infinitésimal. Finalement, on arrive à avoir du coup un, un, un résultat derrière qui est extraordinaire, parce que c'est la nature, vous savez, quand, quand on s'applique, naturellement, elle vous aide, et la faune microbienne démultiplie la valeur, la valeur du sol et, et, et la, la capacité de, de, de pousser avec la chimie. Alors si, c'est sûr, on y arrivait, mais après vous aviez un support, c'est plus un, un sol, c'était un support. Hein. C'est-à-dire qu'il n'y a plus de vie alors que là, c'est de la terre vivante. Tout ça, c'est une symbiose globale de, de, du sol, des plantes, des, des, des micro-organismes qui fait que le, la, la vie se maintient et, 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 et réussit, on réussit à, à, à créer cette vie qui, qui fait que la, la terre vous rend ce que vous lui donnez et ça marche bien. Il faut arrêter d'imaginer que la production intensive va sauver, va sauver l'agriculture. Non, ça va, pas, ça, crée, ça va créer des industriels, mais plus de paysans. On a besoin de paysans, parce que ceux qui vont vraiment respecter l'espace, c'est les paysans, ce pas les industriels de l'agriculture. Ce n'est pas pareil. L'industriel de l'agriculture, c'est un gars qui, fait, euh, des, des, qui regarde les cours des, des bourses hein, et qui va planter en fonction de ça, pas en fonction de l'environnement qu'il va avoir, des enfants qu'il va avoir, qui vont pouvoir vivre sur leur terre. Hein. Ça n'a rien à voir, ça c'est de l'industriel. Nous, on est des paysans où il faut qu'on défende notre mode de production et, et qu'on puisse on, on défendre notre territoire. Jacques Abatucci has proven that farming animals sustainably is possible. But there is another method that goes even further, agroforestry. This allows farming that usually contributes to global warming to become a weapon against it. Agroforestry has existed in certain regions of Portugal for centuries. It involves combining several species of animals, vegetable farming and trees on the same plots. One hour outside of Lisbon, a farmer has brought this system up to date by putting agronomic knowledge and modern technology together. inside close to the cows, okay? Okay. Toma. Toma. Agroforestry, it's the way to cooperate with nature, understanding nature, getting deep on the knowledge of nature. The industrial attitude, it's an attitude of dominating nature. It's completely opposite uh, stories. The results of dozens of years of industrial agriculture are plain to see. On one side are the wooded pastures of Alfredo Cunal. On the other is a desert, the result of decades of intensive cereal farming. Now it's not a soil, it's a subsoil, it's dead. And without soil, you can produce, but not with a natural fer fertility cycle. You have to bring it from outside. If you think that chemical fertility is by it on fuel, on petrol, um, whenever you don't have access to petrol, what, what will we do? So it's, of course, needed to re-establish another ways to grow food. And that's, for us, the unique way that we know now it's based on the natural cycles of fertility. Here, I have future. Uh, I, I, I'm growing my soil. I, I'm managing my ecosystem. I'm getting the ecosystem more rich every day. So I don't need a liter of oil here. Uh, it's completely autonomous. In Alfredo's farming, 
every living animal or plant has a role. And at the center of it all are the trees. They are a source of fiber, means a source of uh, food. Whenever you don't have fiber uh, in the first step on the floor, uh, they can feed directly from the trees or we can cut uh, and bring this fiber to the soil. But they create shadow, what is very important on the, on the summer for the animals. Uh, if, you, if you look with carefully, you will see that behind the tree, the pasture is a different quality, much more quantity and a different quality because there is more organic matter provided by the tree. At the same time, the cows are also helping the tree with their manure directly. These beings are not here only to produce meat. If we only have trees or if we only have cows, all the system will be weaker and uh, directly less resilient. The acorns from the oak trees alone provide 60% of the food for Alfredo's pigs and the benefits for the environment are considerable. If you imagine in terms of uh, energy efficiency, you imagine the efficiency of having a tree uh, producing and uh, pumping food uh, during three, four hundred years. Completely adapted. No fertilizer, no machinery. And now think the other system to feed pigs, that it's based on cereals. Every year you have to move the soil. Every year you have to use a lot of fossil fuels to produce cereals to feed the pigs. The energetic efficiency, it's completely different. Here, it just wait and eat. Industrial agriculture uh, releases a lot of carbon. Um, here, it's the opposite. With this system and with this uh, structure, of agroforestry, we trap a lot of carbon, more than one tonne per hectare per year. If we go in this direction, and if we go in uh, the direction of agroforestry, we can have a big part of the solution of the emissions that we've done, uh, very quick. That's uh, the, the great part of the story. It's not a problem that we do mistakes. The problem is that we are not conscious about that and we don't correct it. Alfredo's farm will soon be home to new trees that he is preparing to plant. They will revive the land that has become infertile due to industrial agriculture and will allow for new herds to graze. You can find beauty in the rain and hear it like a laugh and hear it like a laugh. On a larger scale, introducing agroforestry in France and Europe could allow us to meet the goals for reducing greenhouse gases. But can we feed the planet with such farms and their more limited outputs? Can we really do without industrialization? Les manières entre guillemets alternatives de produire à plus petite échelle avec des cultures plus intégrées, beaucoup plus respectueuses des écosystèmes sont parfaitement réalistes au sens agronomique du mot. Ce sont les seuls réalistes au sens agronomique du mot. Au sens économique Malheureusement, ce sont souvent des productions qui ne sont pas suffisamment compétitives sur les marchés. Pourquoi Parce que les marchés récompensent les producteurs euh, qui produisent avec des économies d'échelle sur des grandes surfaces, que tous les dommages causés au sol, à l'environnement, à la santé publique, résultant de ces manières de produire, ne sont pas reflétés dans le prix de cette alimentation produite selon des processus industriels. Et donc le système est très faussé en défaveur de ces exploitations de plus petite taille qui pratiquent une agriculture différente. Sauf que tout ce qu'on ne paye pas à la caisse du supermarché, on va le payer en, en, en soins de santé dont les coûts explosent, on va le payer en, en nécessité de compenser les dommages environnementaux considérables qui sont causés par certains modes de production industrielle. Et donc ces prix, en quelque sorte, mentent et ne reflètent pas la réalité des coûts sociaux 
d'une production industrielle. We have to change things. Why would you not change things? The only reason not to change things is because you're the person benefiting from them. Who benefits? The people who are making the most money. Farmers don't benefit, the eaters don't benefit, the processors don't benefit. The big corporations who provide the seed, who provide the fertilizer, who process the grain and so on, and they are vertically organized, those are the people who benefit from this. And there's no reason for them to change unless we give them incentive to change. So on a very small level, you can give them incentive to change by saying, I'm not going to eat that way every day. I'm not going to eat that way anymore. I'm going to eat a different way. There are ways of farming animals while respecting their well-being, the planet, and our health. But there is one thing that we can't avoid. In the end, to eat them, we have to kill them. Today, the most stressful moment in a farm animal's life is when they are crammed into the trucks and transported to the abattoir. They often travel hundreds of kilometers before being killed in huge slaughterhouses. Can we kill the animals without making them suffer? However, there is another alternative, and it could easily be used on a large scale. The mobile slaughtery is moving some weeks 800 kilometers. We are going from one farm to another every day. Sometimes there are small roads and we have to go very, very slowly. But we manage so far. With this system, the cows don't go to the abattoir. Instead, the abattoir comes to the farm. Once we come to the farm in the morning, we start then to the slaughtering process. Inside the slaughtery, it's like an ordinary slaughtery, but in a minimized area. And also the veterinary is inside to inspect everything so everything is okay for, for, for food safety. It's important that the animals are at their farm because it's their usual environment. They, can, they know everything about the smell, the sounds, all the other cows, individuals are there. And also the farmer is there who takes care of them every day. And that's just normal. It's better for the animals because they don't have to be loaded onto a transport mixed with other animals they have never met before. And animals get very stressed when they meet new individuals. So they start to find a fight with each other. And when they are in a new place, their last 24 hours will be a nightmare for them. And I really wanted to change that. You seem to take care of the, the welfare of the animals and at the same time, at the end, you, you, you kill them and you bring them death. How do you live with that? Yeah, of course it's a difficult part, but if you accept to eat meat, then you have to realize that we are killing the animals. Of course I respect the people who don't eat meat because they don't want to kill the animals, but I think it's okay if you really care about how they are bred when they are alive. If you're going to eat any meat, you're killing some animals. But there is a difference between killing animals one or 10 or 100 even at a time or in the course of a day and killing thousands a minute, which is how things work now. 
there's a dehumanization factor going on here. It's different from how animals have been treated and dealt with by humans for the first 200,000 years of humans' existence. This is all new. So, should we stop eating animals? It's a choice we all have to make for ourselves. But meeting those who produce our food has shown me it is already possible to do things differently. Viable alternatives exist and can feed us all. It also shows that we can move things along at our own level. By eating less meat, and using the savings to buy better meat that is produced ethically and sustainably. It's what we've decided to do with our son. The scandal of industrial farming is one that we can all act on now without waiting for public decision-making. Part of the solution right here in our hands. When we're here, we find that it's still possible when we're at a moment of limit de changement de la planète et qu'on peut réussir à la préserver. Il faut le faire.